There's no way he would even accept from me an aeroplane ticket. And well, I would like you to welcome with a big, big, hilarious plot, Mr. Cobbert Monica. <laughs> She didn't tell you the whole story. <laughs> About four months ago, she called me and asked me if I would be able to come to this wonderful affair September 9th. And I said I thought I would. Two weeks following me, she sent me three letters. Two months ago, I got a phone call. Last month, I got all kinds of paraphernalia about what's going on today. Two weeks ago, I got a telegram. Today, she came by the motel to get me. As we were leaving, the phone was ringing. She said, aren't you going to answer it? I said, no, I'm afraid it's you. But here we are, and why not? I love that guy. Look at the weather he arranged for you. Hurricanes all over the world. He called the Pope and said, don't fool around. What a wonderful program so far. Oh, wonderful. Listening to Arturo sing some of the melodies from Sergio's performance, it was just well, brought back a lot of memories. Pleasure to follow an act like that. He sings so beautiful. Go ahead. I haven't always been that lucky. About a month ago, I had a singer on the show with me. He was in front of me. He was so bad. I'll tell you how bad he was. While I was on, they were still booing him. Would you believe in the middle of my act, they walked out on him? about Italians, I just finished a whole tour with Frank Sinatra, New York, Chicago, Las Vegas. I use them whenever I can. We were in Rome. Oh, you must go to Rome. If you haven't been, you must go. The Italians, they are so nice. They never get angry. It must be the grapes. You don't tip a cab driver in Italy. He doesn't get mad. He waves at you. For those that don't understand Italian, I mean, good luck. <laughs> Loved Israel. Israel was wonderful. What fighting spirit those people had. And I was thinking about the Jewish people in this country that raised millions of dollars to send to Israel for the wars. I was thinking, what if Italy went to war? <laughs> we Italians, what could we send them? <laughs> Little provolone. <laughs> Some mozzarella. Or six dollars, just enough to buy a white flag. <laughs> because they don't like to fight, I don't blame them. Italians, we like to eat, we like to drink, we like to make love, we like to sing. We don't like to fight. They always talk about the Italian army. There's nothing wrong with it. There's only one problem. They don't understand war terminology. A general says, give me a box of shells. They brought him ziti. They don't have war songs. We Americans, that we're the greatest fighting land in the world because we have over here, over there, anchors away, off we go with the wild blue yonder. What the hell does Italy have? We don't make one the better. You can't march to that. And they don't want to march. Like I said, they don't want to fight. They want to just relax and take it easy. I'll tell you how bad they don't want to fight. Many years ago, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, Italy surrendered. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? A lot of things about wars we do not know. The government keeps a lot of secrets about wars. That Iraqi Kuwaiti war I mentioned, I'll tell you a secret about that time. During that war, Poland sent 100,000 troops to the Gulf 
and Mexico didn't know what to do with them. Italians are the greatest designers, poets, and songwriters. They keep talking about mafia, they're crazy. <laughs> Lucky Luciano once explained it years ago at the Key for Crime Committee when he said, anybody caught sleeping in a trunk of a car deserves to be shot. <laughs> Europe, I would like to remind you when you go to Europe, please take your time. Stop and smell the roses, as they say. It's so beautiful over there. Take a train like I did to many places. Several trains. I was on one train, there was a couple. She was in the upper berth and he was in the lower. She said, Mister, would you get me a blanket? He said, Where's your husband? So let them home. Where's your wife? He said, I left her home. She said, Good, let's play man and wife. He said, all right, get up and get your own blanket. <laughs> I mentioned Italians, I mentioned Israel. I love to do jokes about different people because it breaks down the barrier of bridges. If you laugh at yourself, that's important. But I do not, I do not, like most comedians, I do not do Polish jokes. I do not do that. <laughs> I do jokes about people that nobody else does. I do Eskimo jokes. <laughs> Would you like to hear an Eskimo joke? Yeah. All right. This Eskimo was born in Poland. <laughs> and he called the airline. He said, how long does it take to fly to Alaska? And the girl said, just a minute. He said, thank you, and he hung up. I can never understand why some people in this country are up in arms against the ethnic cultures that migrate here. I think it's great just for the food alone. <laughs> German Wiener schnitzel, Mexican tortillas, and Cuban papaya, and Oriental food, and Jewish delis, and Italian sauces. Even the Pakistani and Indian contributes that red dot in their forehead. You know what that means. <laughs> Coffee's ready. <laughs> show business and I find that all my compatriots have great compassion. I watched my friend Don Rickles at the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas about three months ago. Don Rickles, he stopped the show cold right in the middle. He said, ladies and gentlemen, there are four Arabs sitting ringside. And there were four Arabs in full regalia, robes and headgear. You know, I am of the Jewish faith and Israel has been at war with the Arab nations for many years. But I want these Arabs to understand that I feel like God intended. We should love each other like brothers. And I want them to stand up and take a bow. And they did, and he yelled, open fire! <laughs> well, you have to keep your sense of it. You ever notice when you travel, as I mentioned being away in Europe, when you come back to your little homes, little places of you know, where you live, things change. Nothing major, just little things that you've gone about two months especially like I was. I returned home, I had to get a phone number from information, so I called the operator, she gave me the number, I said, thank you very much. She said, you're welcome and have a nice day. I said, gee, that's nice. I never heard that before. Thank you. She said, you're welcome. I said, you have a nice day. She said, thank you. I said, you're welcome. I forgot the damn number. <laughs> Did we get a wrong call at four o'clock in the morning? And what do you say? You say, we all say, or well, we're brought up to say, you say, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. They hang up in your ear. 
But they woke you up, they're mad. You apologize, they're angry. So I made up my mind, if I'm going to be bothered and they're going to be rude, I'm going to have a little fun. If I get a wrong call, no matter what party they ask for, I'll just say I'm the party, I'll drive them crazy. I get a call one day, the fellow said, Ethel? I said, yes. He said, who's this? I said, who's this? He said, her husband. I said, ha, ha, ha. fixed him good. <laughs> Must tell you my pet peeve. And before I do, I'd like to preface it by saying that I hope none of you here ever have the misfortune of being admitted to an emergency ward. You know. I broke my leg in New York about three years ago on 40th and 5th Avenue. Must be honest, the ambulance crew threw up in two minutes. They were terrific. They picked me up 90 miles an hour through the streets to get me to the hospital. Got me there four minutes. 16 attendants run out with a stretcher, rushed me to the emergency ward, then you lay there for eight hours waiting for a doctor. <laughs> then the nurse shows up. Al Sharpton in a white dress. I don't know if you've ever broken a leg or an arm, but I tell you it's excruciating pain. You're lying there dying. And they ask you a very important medical question. Where you live? <laughs> and why, are you coming for dinner? So what's your blood type? I said, take a sample. It's all over the floor. <laughs> then the doctor shows up. This genius took the scissors, he cut away my pant leg, looked at my leg, he said, Mr. Monica, there's nothing wrong with your leg. I said, you want to look at the one that's broken? <laughs> <laughs> then they play a game, to be or not to be admitted. <laughs> now, if they don't have a room for you, anybody here know where they put you? In the hall. I thought it was only me. You know what a fool you feel like in bed in the hallway? And a lot of people are walking by, relatives of other people that are in the hospital. And there's always an eight-year-old kid straggling behind. He looks at you over the bedpost and they say things like, You're gonna die, aren't you? <laughs> then you finally get a room, but not by yourself. You have to share it with someone. And the fellow you share it with, I don't want to sound morbid, but he's 92 years old and he's on his way out. He doesn't talk to you, he just snores, whistles, and mumbles all night. And all night long, you hear things like... <laughs> They're gonna give me no enema. <laughs> and the night nurse, night nurse sneaks into your room, pulls back the covers, turns you over, sticks in a thermometer, and she leaves. <laughs> and you never see her again. So you lay there for two days like a fudgesicle. <laughs> One nurse came in to give me a bath with the washcloth and the basin. She took the cloth, she washed my face, my neck, my stomach, and she handed me the cloth. <laughs> so I washed her face and her neck and her stomach. Yeah, those nurses are nuts. They work too many hours. My nurse walked in. She said, we do our pee-pee today. <laughs> our pee-pee? What is this, a partnership? I said, yeah, here it is. She said, I didn't see you do it. You know, if they don't see you do it, they don't believe you did it. What the hell do you think you do? Go around stealing pee-pee out of the rooms? I fixed my nurse, I had my brother bring me a glass of apple juice. <laughs> Can we do our pee pee? I said, here it is. She said, I didn't see you do it. I said, I'll drink it down and run it through again. <laughs> she fainted dead away. Anyway, I now live in Florida. Have a nice little home, nothing pretentious. My wife's decorated. Her favorite color is cocoa. Not brown, not beige, has to be cocoa. Then my whole den is cocoa. Cocoa walls, cocoa rugs, cocoa drapes. You put in a cocoa telephone, it keeps ringing. I can't find it. Hey, I 
kid my wife, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm knocking married life. That's not my point of view. To the contrary, I think that marriage can be the greatest relationship that two people can enjoy. Furthermore, doctors have proven that married men live longer than single men. Medical proof that a married man lives longer than a single man. For you single fellas in the audience, if you want a slow death, sound like a chauvinist, but I'm not. I bet I'm the only man here today that remembers his honeymoon morning. Oh, God, I woke up that next morning, and there she was lying next to me. Gorgeous, gorgeous she was, and gorgeous she still is. I could not believe that this beautiful woman who married me had such great trepidation she would cancel the wedding at the last moment, but she never did. She became Mrs. Monica, much to my good fortune. There I was, staring down at this magnificent face. And after a while, she opened her eyes and she said, Good morning, darling. I said, Good morning, sweetheart. She said, What time is it? I said, 10.30. She said, Oh, I slept so late. Should I get up and make you some breakfast? I said, No. And she never asked me again. give you the greatest gift in the world and that's children huh and I think the greatest moment in a man's life is when he goes to the hospital that first time to look upon his newborn child you know how you walk down the corridor past the labor ward and there's a few girls in labor and they're just lying around <laughs> screaming mumbling cursing oh a lot of cursing oh lots of cursing I was in the army eight years I never heard this kind of language and the things they wish upon their husbands. One girl screamed, this pain he should have in his right eyeball. And you get to that big glass, and they roll the baby out in the bassinet. And at that precise moment, you look upon your newborn child, and you think back of the sleepless nights, the anxieties, the anticipations. And now you know you're being rewarded a million times over. For lying before you is the greatest gift in life, your own flesh and blood. I don't know how many of you ladies and gentlemen have seen your child just a few minutes old. But take my word. <laughs> You're not passing that monkey off on me, pal. <laughs> and you give me the smooth one in the corner over here. <laughs> and you call this apricot with ears, my kid? <laughs> there, my daughter was born. She was all red and wrinkled. I should have realized that my wife burns everything. <laughs> and my boy, like an insect with eyes. I used to visit him in a hospital. I yelled, get the cricket out. <laughs> but good kids. I have wonderful, wonderful kids. I have a 30-year-old son, has his own apartment in my house. <laughs> you have one of those? Where do we go wrong? I'm trying to get him to learn a trade so we'll know what kind of work he's out of. Kids today have everything. We were five brothers, all slept in one room. I never slept alone till I got married. <laughs> Show you how small my apartment was when I was a kid. When my mother and father wanted to make love, they told me to look out the window. One day I was looking out the window. My father said, what do you see? As a couple across the way are making love. He said, how do you know? It's because their kid is looking at me. <laughs> and what kind of 
good job these kids get. My younger son just graduated college. I'm worried about him. He doesn't have any prospects. He, Dad, don't worry. Starting September 15th, I'm going to work for the sanitation department. I'm going to be a mumback man. And what the hell's a mumback man? Because I stand behind the truck and I tell him, Mumback. 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 You've been most wonderful, and may I commend you for, without people like you, we wouldn't have a foundation like this, and all these young people wouldn't get an opportunity. Let us hope that 20 years from now, I can be standing on the stage, you can be sitting in the audience. After the show, we go home, get into our pajamas, sit in front of the TV set, turn the TV on, and watch the rest of the O.J. Simpson trial. Good night. Good night. How about a hand for Roberto Iruzzi? Roberto, come on up here. Roberto will perform the Foreign Grato. And this is a very special and uh, personal tribute to Sergio.